Hello, everyone. Thank you to be here. It's been a long day, but we are here <laughs> with uh, Zachary Harnell from uh, Y Green Energy Fund and Justin Kapos from New York University. And we will hear about using Docker Content Trust Notary with Kubernetes Admission Controller to further secure, secure your runtime. So thank you, and I will clean the stage. All right, thank you very much. So I'm gonna be kicking us off here. Um, I'm gonna be talking about Tuff and Notary and how they work together to um, secure the way that software is delivered. So, uh, yep, uh, we've already been introduced. Uh, my co-presenter, Zach, is gonna come on a little bit later and talk a little bit about some of the Notary-specific things, but I will first be talking about Tuff. Tuff is the specification uh, that Notary is based on. Uh, that I, I created along with um, one of my former students uh, with some input from some folks at the Tor project. Okay, so basically what we're gonna be talking about here is we're gonna be talking about all the problems and issues you have with trying to deliver software of any sort. In this case, of course, we'll be thinking mostly about software um, like you know container images and things like this. Um, how Tuff addresses these challenges, and then we'll look in practice about how this actually works. All right, so today, there is a scary attack vector, okay? It's this thing that's waiting there to get into your data centers, to take all your data, to, to make all of your worst fears come true. And this is something that is used by world-class hackers all around the world. This is uh, something that the absolute top uh, creme de la creme of the hacking community uses to go after high value targets when they want to cause damage. It's something that bypasses firewalls, all sorts of network defenses, other um, you know, sorts of defenses that you would have that would usually catch these type of vectors. Uh, it's something that can be used on basically any type of computational device. It's not just limited to containers, you, you can, and people have demonstrated, it's easy to hack cars, it's easy to hack the power grid, um, you can hack medical devices, you can hack all sorts of other things this way, uh, pretty much anything you can dream of. Um, and when you do this, you basically get unrestricted access, in many cases, to the devices that you've hacked. All right, and uh, usually, since I'm a professor and I like to give pop quizzes, I would stop and ask you guys uh, what this attack vector is, but I think it's kind <laughs> of obvious in this context that what we're really talking about here is hacks that come from software updates and software update, uh, like software updaters in uh, particular. All right, and if, uh, you know, there are many victims that have been hit by these types of attacks. This isn't something that only happens to uh, poor, unprepared companies that have under-resourced security teams, although it does happen to them as well. Um, really, the companies you think of as having the best security teams in the world, in many cases, have also had their users impacted by hacks on uh, the software update infrastructure. And in um, some cases, you know, the, the, when I talk about the world-class hackers, uh, you have situations uh, like the Flame malware uh, that was a big part of taking down around centrifuges along with Stuxnet, um, where Flame was the much more complicated thing that did all of the, um, the reconnaissance in that environment, was based on several different um, issues and problems with the way that Windows was doing updates. And you've seen companies time and time again get hacked through their infrastructure and uh, have a lot of problems or concerns uh, with security as a result, uh, including I think there was something a week or something like that ago, but I you know I can't really remember. <laughs> I don't have a great memory for these kind of things. Um, okay, but isn't this just an easy problem? Like hey, you know, if I have crypto and I put crypto on something, it just solves all my problems, right? Just like I have this bike and I put a lock on my bike, so now no one could possibly steal my bike in any way, right? Um, well, unfortunately, in practice, it's a lot more complicated than that. Um, and so, can you just use a simple solution? Um, hey, you know, I, like, I trained my mom to look for the little green padlock and things when she goes to websites, and that's important. So, can't we just look for the little green padlock and then say that our 
software updates are okay um, in our updaters. And the problem is, is that you know you have this you know deputized server here that's your software update server in that case, and you have all your nice little devices that you might want to go and and um, you know protect here. And what happens in this case is a bad guy goes and breaks into your server, and then all of your devices are hacked. And this is how. This is one of the ways that your company gets its name on that kind of wall of shame tech company slide that I had earlier. Um, you could also say, hey, uh, maybe we could just have some kind of signing key. Like maybe we have a signing key, could be like a GPG key, it could be something inside of an HSM um, that we protect really well and we stick it in our build environment and you, you, know, you have to get onto that server and have to be, you know, um, there in order to sign things, so we're really safe, right? And um, no, you're not. Then you, depending on how you do it, whether you have multiple keys that get distributed as some of the distros do that are allowed to sign, then if any of those keys gets compromised, then you can go and uh, hack the devices. If you instead are in the situation where you have the single server with the HSM, then as we've seen happen time and time again for these other organizations, somebody breaks in and yes, because you have an HSM, they can't take the key off the device, but what they, you know, has happened in um, cases for companies that I won't name to be polite to them, uh, but very high profile Linux distributions that we all know about and many of us use, uh, hackers have just gone and broken into the server and uploaded their malicious software they wanted to sign there and then had it signed on that server and then used it to launch attacks, okay? So uh, those don't help. All right, so the two easy solutions that most people think about don't work, okay? Um, so now the question is, is it even really possible to protect yourself? Do you just have to, is it necessary you have this single point of failure and you can't get around that, okay? And the answer is no, um, you don't, it, 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 or sorry, it is possible, sorry. It is possible. You don't have to have a single point of failure. Um, and TUF was designed with a few different principles in mind. Okay, so TUF is designed with the idea that your servers, your keys, your infrastructure will be compromised. It's not, you know, a, a question of like if or, you know, whatever it's, this is going to happen, and how do we take you from this state to put you into, you know, get you from where you are back into a state that is secure again when, when you enter into an insecure state? And how do you do things like make it so that a single compromise doesn't result in a serious risk to your users? So, you know, when you look at recent disclosures about hacking incidents that have happened and the potential impact. Um, you can see that that impact was in many ways very much minimized uh, because attackers didn't have access and because certain parts of the system were not uh, trusted in a way they would have been had there, be a, had there been a single repository you know, that, hold, that you must trust for everything. Okay, another, um, another principle of tough is to support uh, the way that people use and, and want to build and deploy their software. So um, tough is not something where it says thou shalt follow these 87 commandments and check all these boxes and um, you have to, you know, in order to use tough, um, so in order to use tough, you don't have to, you know, subscribe to some special uh, philosophy about how you manage your keys or how you do other things. Uh, tough, it works within your, your current model and in fact, different people that deploy tough deploy tough in slightly different ways that meets their needs. So if you're managing sensitive data on behalf of a lot of different organizations, then we have folks that go and all of their signings for sensitive aspects of the system are done inside YubiKeys and you have to have thresholds of signatures from developers to do releases and so on. And we have other people where, um, you know, literally a developer can just go and sign using a key on their system to go and distribute an update out to maybe a testing cluster or do other things like that. Um, okay, a another feature of Tough is it's easy to adopt and use. So when you go and um, want to go and use Tough in your environment, 
it's the sort of thing where when you look at some of the picture diagrams and things like this, it looks more complicated than it is. It, it's, uh, you pay sort of a one-time upfront cost to integrate it into your environment, which, you know, depending on what your tool chain and things look like, can take you a few hours to a day or so um, to get it into a reasonable environment. Um, you know, your mileage may vary. Ask other people who've gone through the process and they'll give you their, their own answers and what they, um, what they liked and what, they, what took them longer. Um, but once you do that, it's basically automatic in your system. So people are doing all the same sorts of actions that they do today. It's just now they might be signing something they weren't signing before. Okay, so inside of Tuff, there are a few different types. Uh, one of the concepts that makes Tuff have this compromise resilience is that Tuff has different roles that do different things. So um, just like if I um, you know, want to go and uh, you know, I have a secretary who has a key uh, to get into my office but can't get into certain other offices on the floor, um, and the secretary can use her key to get into my desk drawer and get things out of there, uh, but, you know, the janitor can get into everybody's office but can't get into anybody's desks, right? And so you can separate out what different roles inside of a real-world organization are allowed to do based on what they need to do, and Tuff does very much the same thing um, where it separates out actions that need to happen to protect your security into a series of different uh, roles that each can do different things. The root role um, can go and serve as the root of trust in the system. It can revoke trust in, uh, in uh, other keys and serves as the baseline for root, for, for the root of trust, as I said. Uh, targets are a way to say this is the this is the specific package or image that um, is you know is valid. It, there's supposed to be a package that has this hash. There's supposed to be an image that has a secure hash. The timestamp role indicates when things have changed. It says things like um, you know is there a later version of this? Is there not a later version? And the snapshot role is uh, most relevant in situations where you have things like a bunch of microservices that interact or you have package dependencies, but it makes sure that you have a um, consistent snapshot of the types of um, things that exist at a time so that you can't be told that uh, some wildly out of date piece of software is the latest version and some other known vulnerable version of some other piece of software is the latest version. Um, the attacker sort of has to pick a, uh, a place, um, you know, a, a valid version of the repository to give to you that's later than what you've seen and that has a consistent set of software on it that actually existed together on the repository at a time. All right, so um, the way that this all works is you have your organization that has your, uh, um, that has a series of different files here. Um, here we have an example where we look at how we do key rotation. So if uh, for some reason you go and you have a uh, piece of root metadata uh, and um, typically what people do is every three to six months they'll go and rotate their keys to make sure that they haven't lost them or done something like this. In order to do that um, or in order to deal with a compromise, for instance a compromise of the timestamp role, you simply generate a new root uh, metadata signed with the old keys and, um, and go and link to your new pieces of metadata, and this effectively lets you rotate keys. So you can deal with situations where you have an incident where, for instance, um, one of your root keys is lost or compromised, or the YubiKey doesn't work anymore, or whatever else, and uh, deal with those situations, uh, as I just described. One other important uh, mechanism that you have inside of Tuff is that um, you can go and you can delegate trust. So you can say that different people are responsible for different packages inside of a system. Um, so for instance, I might be responsible for releasing a, a tough package or images related to that, and um, you know, there's a, another developer who might be responsible for releasing the notary package, and then maybe there's a team of developers that there will be further delegations off of that are responsible for releasing packages under a project like Spiffy. Uh, and what this means is, is that if someone breaks in and they steal my key, they can't go 
and, mod and release a validly signed uh, version of Spiffy that people will trust. Because I'm not a trusted person to release Spiffy in, in this example, okay? Um, one other thing we do with Tuff is the way that we integrate it into your system, it, it, it means that the keys themselves get used at different rates naturally. So how often do you have a break-in that requires you to replace all keys? Or that re requires you to break a key, it's, or to replace a key? It's probably a very rare event, something that happens you know, maybe once a year, one would hope, if, if, it mo if even that much. But how often do you possibly release a new version? You might do that every, you know, every hour, or every few minutes, or something like that, every few seconds, who knows? So the different keys in the system tend to get used at different cadences. So a uh, key like the timestamp key uh, tends to be an online key that gets used on in your uh, mirror infrastructure, possibly your repository um, itself. The snapshot is typically on a repository. And then the root and targets roles in our deployments are basically always kept offline in the system. And uh, the targets roles might be things that developers have their Yubi keys that they plug in when they need to do a new release. And the root role would be something that uh, is only used when you have a, a key compromise, which should be a very, very rare event. And so um, the level of risk you have when a key is compromised also depends very heavily on what that key is. If someone steals a timestamp key, all they can really do is say there has not been a new release when there has actually been a new release, okay? They can't say this is a valid new release, all right? Because the timestamp role points to a piece of metadata that has to be signed by the snapshot role that has to point to validly sign uh, target delegations that have to say what the new release is, right? So if somebody breaks in into a repository and steals online keys, they typically can only do things like um, influence the timestamp or snapshot rules, which doesn't let them distribute images to your users. It just lets them lie about whether updates have happened or not. You know, I can say, oh, you haven't had an update. Not a big deal. Okay, um, and then other roles like targets and root are usually physical keys, and so they usually have much more protection. Um, Tuff also supports, and a lot of people who use it, use multi-signature trust. So you, if you have very sensitive keys like your root key, um, then typically you'll go and you'll have, you can set it up so two out of six people have to sign it, um, nine out of ten, whatever you think is appropriate for your environment. And we have some of the automakers and other folks that use Tuff uh, keep their keys in, uh, you know, sensitive, distributed around the world areas, while we have other organizations that manage it differently. So it all depends on what makes sense for you. Um, right, and if you do have a threshold signature and something goes wrong, it's not a big deal, uh, as long as up to your threshold isn't compromised. Uh, Tuff has a lot of improvements over similar security systems, so we really designed our system, and if you look at other systems, like you know the way GPG signing works, the way that um, X509 certificate revocation, and you know think they do things like that on the web, you can tell that those systems were not primarily designed with revocation as a number one priority, right? These were kind of bolted onto the side later. Tuff was designed with revocation as a number one priority from, you know, the, you know, the whole purpose of it is to support that well. So we have a bunch of um, ways that we do whitelisting, key management, multi-signature trust, revocation, key rotation, um, all sorts of aspects like that that, um, uh, you know, I'd be happy to answer questions and talk more about later on. Um, Tuff is itself used in a lot of different environments, uh, which I think I'm going to yet yeah, talk briefly about on the next slide. And so um, the spec itself is very stable, uh, but it does slowly evolve over time to meet the needs of the people that use it. So um, we've had some really great interactions with uh, folks uh, um, in the cloud community uh, especially folks both from Docker and CoreOS have been very involved in um, our, the process of evolving little pieces of Tuff to add things that they want in their environments. Um, we've wor also worked a lot with a bunch of different automakers and a bunch of folks in the um, sort of programming language, VM, uh, 
uh, space, or uh, sorry, programming language library space that have also uh, pushed a lot of things. So if you're interested in reading about what's coming or possibly participating or learning more, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, we've had, you know, we're very grateful to all of the companies and organizations that have gone and deployed uh, Tough into production. And uh, we hope that uh, you'll adopt it as well and get your logo up here uh, also. So to take us home and talk about the rest of it, we're gonna be talking about one of those uh, awesome companies that's doing great things with Tough. So Zach, uh, why don't you take it away? Thanks so much. <clears throat> that was kind of awesome, right? Yeah, you should probably. Uh, by the way, that link is live, so if at any point, uh, we'll have time at the end for questions, but <clears throat> if at any point you're like, hey, actually, before I forget, I want to write that down. Uh, I see it right here, so don't hesitate to ask questions. Hello, everyone. I'm Zach. Um, thank you, Justin. Uh, Tough is an incredible standard, and I think one of the things that we should arrive at as a, con as a conclusion from, from his introduction is simply that this is an extremely well-designed and thought-through uh, software update framework. So, uh, which I don't even know if we said it, but Tough literally stands for the update framework. So if you hear Tough, the update framework, that's what it is. Okay, so uh, what Notary is, is a, an open source project underneath the CNCF that uh, allows you to implement Tough for arbitrary software. You can sign anything, but where it really shines and what it was, um, what a lot of uh, the maintainers in the Mobi project or Docker have done a really good job of is integrating it into the CI process for building images. So uh, all of everything that he just said, you're about to watch, we basically get for free. This one-time penalty cost is actually extremely low. The, the bar is really easy if you're working with containerized software to get into moving more in this direction of secure software delivery. So uh, Docker Content Trust, you just said it. I should have looked down before I just clicked to the next slide. Um, the, the notary aspect is simply the signing and management of all the keys, and it is actually really manageable. And then there's an enforcement layer. So if you're using containers in something like Kubernetes, uh, we need to be able to enforce that the software that we're deploying into our clusters is actually the exact thing that we intended. So how does it work? Uh, well, here's a picture I took literally from uh, the Docker documentation, uh, and it's actually going to highlight there are some keyword differences between Notary and Docker Content Trust. But if you hear Docker Content Trust, think Notary. If you hear Notary, think Docker Content Trust. I know that they're not one-to-one, -one, but for the case of Docker, they are. Uh, in the specific instance of everything that Justin was talking about, a targets key is a repository key, a timestamp key is a timestamp key, and a snapshot key is like a Docker tag. So like latest would have a snapshot key associated with it, and we'll see that right, oh, never mind. I guess we won't see that right here. That's in a diagram later. So uh, what does it look like for white green? Um, we deploy frequently. Uh, with a completely automated homegrown set of tools. Uh, shout out to people who still use Bash to deploy. Anybody? No, okay, and everybody's better than we are, all right. Uh, and uh, so I guess, you know, Notary can be used with Bash, which is nice, and uh, pretty much any security tool can be used as long as its implementation, interaction, and maintenance is more or less automatic in our environment. We don't have the resources, uh, engineering or otherwise, to be able to spend a ton of time working with a lot of uh, aggressive security measures. Uh, I wish we had like full time, dedicated, all of this stuff. Like we can, we have occasional audits and a lot of people who are security minded, but no dedicated team to this. So when we implement tools, we need them to be automatic. And that's the cool thing because look at that, it is automatic. So basically our desired flow uh, is a developer pushes our CI tool, which is Atlassian Bamboo, uh, builds, scans, and signs. Uh, using Notary, and then the deployment aspect is into Kubernetes, and we enforce it with this awesome open source tool from our friends over at IBM called Portieris. I think Portieris is Greek for the word gatekeeper, uh, so Greek nautical terms are all over this community, uh, and, and that is one of them. So um, how can we achieve all of this? We need to use delegations. I don't want to put all of my targets keys into my CI server because then it basically becomes this thing that if hacked, 
a hacker is able to release arbitrary versions of correctly signed software into my cluster and everything's okay. So that is like super bad and scary and it basically takes tough and makes it useless if you just keep everything online. Uh, the way that we treat our root key is it's offline um, and stored securely somewhere that it takes a lot of effort to get to and the target's keys are, uh, they are also stored in a secure password manager, like a hardware security module, um, but, but for all intents and purposes, offline. Uh, we use the delegation roles that we will see here in just a moment to be able to manage the process of allowing our CI server to securely sign versions of our software. So, this was the diagram I was looking for earlier. Here we go. So this is a, a great way to understand how Docker and Tuff interact together. So we have a root key stored in the mountain in the Himalayas uh, on top of Mount Everest on a YubiKey, and then uh, our target key would be an example of like, this is the registry. So I think I was talking to, remind me of your name, is it Sergey? I was talking to Sergey earlier. When, in the context of Docker, a root key is essentially an organization inside of, uh, in Docker. So docker.io slash organization name would be a root key. Uh, a target key would be organization name slash the name of your image. Uh, so that would be like microservice A, B, C, D. Uh, a snapshot key is like a tag in Docker. So latest, Git SHA, uh, version 1.2. All of those are snapshots keys, timestamp keys, timestamp keys, and the way that we Allow this is Docker has a special type of delegation you can use. It's called target slash releases. It must be named that. You cannot misspell it or it will not work. Target slash releases, you can delegate uh, your snapshot key to a target's releases key and then it is allowed to push images using the Docker command line interface uh, and push the signed associated trust metadata to notary. Okay, how's everybody doing? That was like so many buzzwords. <laughs> Okay, cool, everybody's alive. I got a chuckle. Okay, cool, uh, I, so I've talked a few times, uh, but I have never done a live demo, so everybody pray for me. Uh, I just wanted to show you, before you guys got here, I associated a root key, uh, but I just want you to know how simple it was. I did docker push, and it prompted me for a root key, and I'll show you exactly what happened. So I entered it really, bad passphrase, A, B, C, D, one, two, three, four. I'm gonna delete the organization later, so it won't work by the time you see this on YouTube. But, uh, yes. So, let's see if I can get my IDE up here. Oh, nope, did that work? That was a picture I took, Mac stole it from me. I'm kidding. Um, everybody see that? Whoa, that is huge. Okay, um, and I can't see it here, so I'll have to look up there. So what you see here is I am going to run all of these commands for you, but the little chunk between 14 and 17, well, 14 and 16, that's how you push a secure image. If it looks like Docker build and Docker push, well good news it is. It's literally built into the Docker tool chain. You, you get this stuff for free, which is amazing. So all of this is super nice. How much penalty would you have to pay for an upfront cost? None. So uh, the first two lines up here, I'm basically blowing away everything, every key that exists in my private repository uh, in my local machine, just to prove to you that there are no tricks up my sleeves. Uh, the key that you see right there, if you remember the slide previous, I did, I generated a root key. I'm just copying in the root key because that will be necessary to make a new uh, targets key. Um, I came up with a Go app because everything cool is written in Go apparently these days. And uh, it is a one line thing. It says, hello, secure DockerCon. Uh, it was imaginative, I know. Um, so we're going to build that app. Uh, so I will run these commands right here in the terminal and you will watch, hopefully, how easy this is. Okay, so I've copied it in there and now I'm gonna do an unsecure push. So basically, uh, what you see here, this export, this is environment variable, docker underscore content underscore trust equals zero. That is the special environment variable that will turn on in the docker CLI content trust, or turn off. Zero is off, one is on. Um, so. 
I will turn it off and do, I will do an insecure push and I will demonstrate that I can build and push an image and download it because, uh, well, because I guess you would need to. Okay, so I pushed an image and look at that. I ran the image and it says, hello, secure DockerCon at the bottom. So we can build an unsecure image, but that's not really what you came here to see. So why don't we do it securely? So now I'm basically just going to turn on Docker Content Trust. I'm going to repeat the process, but this time I'm gonna push and you'll see something else come with it. So, go down here, let's make this, can I make this any bigger? No, sorry, you'll have to really squint. Okay, so we'll rebuild, and then we're going to push. And this push, it says, this refers to something, and I'm gonna get prompted. It says, signing and pushing trust metadata. Okay, so signing and pushing trust metadata. Now, it's connected to an endpoint. The endpoint for Docker uh, Hub exists at notary.docker.io. The endpoint for key.io, if you use that container registry, is just key.io. Um, and that will become important later on in the script. Uh, but it's saying, okay, this is a new repository to me. This is a brand new trusted collection. I need to make a target key so that I can now make this repository a tough repository. You initialize this organization with a root key, so I need the password for it, which is A, B, C, D, one, two, three, four. And now I will enter a passphrase for this. It says, I need you to enter a passphrase for the repository key. The repository key equals uh, target's key. So. I will also enter in an ultra secure password, CD1234 securely. And it will say, okay, finished initializing, successfully signed. So what just happened is now a target key was generated. It's stored in my local directory. The, uh, a snapshot key was generated as well for the colon latest hyphen secure tag on this repository image. Um, and that metadata was signed by all of the, the target key, the snapshot key, and the timestamp key, and pushed to the server. I have how many minutes? Eight, okay, thank you. I will try to get done fast. This is the end, so should be good. All right, so now I am going to try to run, so keep in mind my terminal is still in Docker Content Trust mode, I'm gonna to try to run an image that wasn't signed. Remember, we didn't sign the latest tag, we only signed the latest secure tag. And what happens? I get this error, there's no valid trust data for latest. So automatically you have enforcement in some way that nobody actually signed this image. There's no recognizable uh, trust metadata associated with this image. This is really powerful because that means that it's super easy to verify if all of the targets, timestamps, snapshot keys, everything was signed appropriately in the correct way. It's, I really love the Docker people, they did an awesome job with this, integrating in the tool chain. Um, and if we were to run this image, you obviously see it does run secure images successfully. Hello, secure DockerCon. So, oh, you know what, actually, that's not a good test because technically it was still local. So, let's do it again and prove Yes, it works. So we have a secure image. Yay, that's awesome. Uh, but that's not really the whole story. Because now we have a bunch of keys on our computer and it's still not super great. Uh, so we need to add a delegation. So adding a delegation, uh, it's as simple as generating a public and private key. Uh, these are all commands. I literally <laughs> Googled it on Stack Overflow this morning. These are all commands that are super easy to find. Uh, the, um, you can generate just a quick self-signed cert. Uh, it's worth mentioning that this is a certificate, so if your company has something like they need a certificate to be signed by a CA, if you wanna do some sort of provenance mechanism like that, you can. I'm demonstrating that it's super easy to do with just a self-signed certificate. The point is, is it's a private key that only your CI server will have in order to sign images. Okay, so we'll generate a certificate, and we will add it by using, ah, uh, now I'm switching to the notary, uh, command line interface, but Docker Content Trust has integrated this into their tool chain. So all of these commands can be accessed by using Docker Trust instead of Notary. But because I learned Notary, I decided to do Notary. So I'm gonna say Notary, delegation add. Oh, I have to finish the certificate, thank you. 
we'll do that and add a common name. We'll say like our bamboo server and we're done. So now we need to add a delegation. So we're notary delegation add for the repo, docker, zpRnold, org, test123, and I'm giving it that special targets releases role, if you guys remember that. And I'm saying use this certificate and it's allowed to sign anything. So it's saying, okay, cool, I added that delegation right here to the key and it's staged for publishing. All right, so in the same way that like basically do git push is we're gonna do a notary publish. We're gonna say notary publish the latest information on this repo. And it's gonna ask for my Docker username, which I will need to find my password over here. And hopefully I don't accidentally paste this somewhere I shouldn't. Cool. And now it's saying, okay, cool. You can add this delegation, but keep in mind it needs to be signed by the targets key in order for this to happen. So we'll enter our password, our ultra secure password, ABCD1234. And there you go. So now this key can be used to sign any image in our repository. And this key it, you can put up in your CI server. And in the same way that the tough standard enforces survivable key compromise, you can do all of this with the rest of your baby server. Uh, the commands that you see down here are, this is the literal set of commands that you would run on another server. So in your CI pipeline, you would use notary key import, the private key, and then docker build, docker push. Uh, I'm not going to demonstrate that because we've already built and pushed. Um, so hopefully that was interesting. I'm gonna go back to these slides after everyone puts phones. Yeah, okay, everybody got a photo, cool. I think the slides are public somewhere. Okay, so we did, we created an image registry, we brought a root key online, we um, added, we generated a targets key, we added a delegation certificate and we published. So that's exactly what we did. So now we get into enforcement. A signed image is only useful if you can depend on its signature and enforce it. Uh, there is a tool that exists, we're not going to have time to basically get into the nitty gritty, but essentially there is this awesome tool uh, called Portieris that you can install into your Kubernetes cluster and you can enforce the signing of images on a particular repository. I will show you a demonstration of one of those policies. It supports key.io, Docker Hub, and uh, ICR, and you have basically an image policy or a cluster image policy. I don't have time to explain how it enforces, but um, it does. <laughs> uh, sorry. But basically, what you can do is essentially say, I have this image policy, it's a, this is a Kubernetes manifest, um, and for any key.io slash ygreen slash star, uh, trust enabled is true, the trust server is there, and you can basically enforce that it has to be signed with a particular dele delegation role or key. And we have a particular production key that must be signed with that production key in order to uh, live in the production cluster and run. So, uh, and then basically Portieris works that before a pod is admitted to the cluster, it checks all of this information first. And we will see here in this workflow diagram that if trust is enabled, <coughs> Uh, if it's not, uh, don't allow it, but if it is, is there a signed version of the tag? Uh, if there's not, deny it. If there is, is there a signer key specified? No, it's fine, you can still allow it, but otherwise, if there is a signer key, then patch so that you have the appropriate SHA-256 hash of the, uh, of the Docker container image at a particular tag. So. Uh, what I found out is all of the work that we did in, in uh, Bamboo and trying to get all of this working, all of our bash scripts, it turns out that Justin and his amazing team with Santiago have been working on a tool that basically does everything we needed to do, which is in Toto. Uh, it is a software supply chain uh, management tool and it integrates tough at the heart of it. I would highly recommend this. Uh, it is something that when I get back to my desk at Ygreen, we will be working on implementing because it covers basically the entirety of our use case and some things that we didn't even think about. Um, unfortunately, I don't get to go deep into detail with it, but uh, it is worth investigating. It is worth your time. Uh, but for now, I wanted to thank you for your attention and ask for any questions that you may have. Uh, if you have any question, just walk here so they will be recorded. Thank you. Thanks for staying this late in the day. Good job. 
So uh, initially when creating keys, you do have been just creating keys, uh, private and public keys, right? And then when you did delegation, you actually did certificate. Yes. All kinds of extra stuff. That Correct. Do you so, need certificate there or is it still just the you? So the, um, I can, I can sh well, no, we don't have time, but um, the keys that are created are private keys. It's just the Docker uh, CLI creates them for you. Uh, so when you're using targets keys and or repository keys and snapshot keys, all of that's done for you. In the specific instance of a delegation key, you generate a private key, but then in order to, for the notary, uh, in order for the notary server to be able to recognize that this is a valid delegation, it needs to have been signed by the private key with the corresponding public key. Okay, so it, yeah. it is truly a certificate signed it by It really is a certificate. Uh, yeah, and, and it doesn't need to be. You could, um, there is support for GPG keys and doing other things like this that gets used in some implementations. So there's nothing fundamental that means it has to be X509, but it can just be that. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Hi. Um, great talk, by the way. Um, yep. So this question is, I think, uh, more targeted at um, tough and more so the question is around revocation. Um, revocation is really hard. Um, and it seems like more and more people are coming to this ideology that let's just not do revocation, but use really short-lived uh, credentials. Yeah. No. What's your viewpoint on this? Um, well, if you have short-lived credentials, you have to rotate them. And there's this problem called also the secure introduction problem of how if you're, so if you have a long-lived thing, you have to rotate the credential securely. If you have a short-lived thing that you keep spinning up and killing, you have to keep provisioning things that you can trust. And so I think it's very much moving the problem around. Now, uh, Tuff itself, actually, in one of the new changes to Tuff, is exactly to enable that style of key rotation, because there are times in which that's useful. But if you don't have revocation also, then you, you, you have to have some way to have a root of trust and to establish that. And you, you need that in a system also. So I don't view it as an either or. I view it as um, additional value add that a system needs to have. Thank you. Yep. Cool. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everybody.